discover how these patterns, which were then relatively simple, were appearing in this area, approximately 40 miles radius of Stonehenge in southern England. And that, of course, is where I lived at that time. The outcome of the provision of three reports from me, and this is early 80s, early mid 80s, remember, was uh, an announcement in the uh, British government, House of Commons, that they accepted there was a real phenomena. There's something the media haven't picked up on too. Reported in Hansard five times and in recent weeks other de developments which we will talk about. The British government themselves saying there is a genuine phenomenon. There's a core phenomenon uh, here. The explanation though that I have to be again totally upfront with, not acceptable to me, but I of course uh, have to tell you that uh, the British government's view is that the phenomenon is not a mystery at all. It's very unusual, but it isn't a mystery. These are being caused by a new kind of whirlwind, a new meteorological phenomenon, one commonly, popularly now referred to as a plasma vortex. This is a rotating field of electrified air, uh, which during nighttime uh, accounts for the golden balls of light people are seeing, the UFO. It accounts for that. It also is responsible for dropping into the field of cereal crop and causing a circle. Well, at a push, and I've spoken to most of the leading meteorolog meteorologists, including, of course, Terence Meaton, who we were working with in Europe, and since uh, Professor Snow and other people here, uh, and they find it uh, hard to imagine that that kind of phenomena could even cause a single crop circle because of the well-defined cut-off edges, the lack of damage, no evidence that that kind of plasma, uh, ball lightning, basically, could cause an effect of that kind. How about the sizes? Well, those that I doubt if you've seen, unless you're following the research itself, the smallest are these guys here, actually a little smaller. 12 inches to 18 inches, we do have some. But there, this category of circle, which is not particularly exciting, it's not going to hit your national newspaper or even the books on the phenomena or the research because they're really not dramatic. But it's the same phenomena. There were hundreds of these appearing in the landscape when the matter was taken to the British government. These were appearing not only in the public areas, they were appearing in the military areas. They were appearing on Salisbury Plain, for anybody who's visited the area, which is an exclusion zone. You are not permitted to overfly it, let alone drive through it. It's surveyed from the air on satellites. It's a very secure area. This phenomena is appearing inside there. This circle here, of course, could be gained access for its construction by these tractor tire marks. And you're going to see a lot of these tractor tire marks. These do provide access points. Since 1980, in Europe, they have. The system of sowing <coughs> <coughs> the seed and then fertilizing, running down the same tractor tire mark throughout the growing period, is what that's all about. They didn't use the system before 1980. And when the farmers discovered the circles before 80, they were saying, the media, the government can say what they like. There were no tracks in or out of the circles we found. Nobody had been there. When they walk away and we arrive on the scene, invariably, there's one. And it's the track of the farmer that found it. These are oilseed rape plants uh, bent into position uh, in a circle approximately 70 feet in diameter. And what you find, if you lifted those surface plants and had a look underneath, it's a whole different story. Those plants are lying along two overlaid sine waves, like this, out of phase, breaking away into the center, remember that's what's under each one of these, on the peak of a, a single sine wave, running underneath here. Peak, trough, peak, trough, etc. Highly complex. Not always are the plants spiraled. Sometimes they're, it's like a radial firework airburst straight out from the center to the periphery. And what we are calling an S-type uh, pattern 
because of course they are laid along uh, an S-type wave like this with a tendency to reverse in the center and just on the uh, periphery itself. This is a ripened plant like the thousands that are in those crop circles and they're not nettled. They're not bent. It's as if the, they're made supple throughout the construction phase, that period of construction, and then hardened up again. The oilseed rape plant, which is a, indeed a brittle plant, which is an example of here, very positively will not only knuckle, it will snap off. It will separate because it's brittle when you push it over beyond a, an angle of about 45 degrees. That's the starch crystal under microscope of the plants involved. The uh, lattice structure, very different to everything and anything they had ever seen before, was as the days passed, the structure hardened and tightened as this is from the circumference towards the center, returning to this about two weeks later. So there was some residual effect which clearly was still moving, onward going, changing the lattice structure of the crystal itself. These plants are more healthy than the plants that are growing or are in the circumference in the field that's totally unaffected. These plants are vigorous, they have growth, they have color, they have healthy hair, as it were. They have bounce, and they're not damaged. There's something different about these plants. Much more significant is the fact that the grain taken from, say, last year's crop circle in the US, in Canada, in Australia, in England, in Australia, wherever, wherever they come from, they've been tested. The grain is germinating up, up to a maximum of 40% faster than the stock they came from. They are growing more extensively than the stock they came from, from the controls. The root structure is more extensive. It's more healthy than the plant stock they came from. The suggestion at this point, that is incidentally, a change at the cellular anatomic level in the plants themselves. That is an effect which cannot be replicated, we are told, by the most eminent biophysicist in this country, by human feet, ropes and chains. The nearest we can even replicate that effect is by low levels of microwave radiation. That indeed, an increase in internal temperature albeit for a short period of time, probably only 15 seconds, and we'll come back to that, it's causing these expulsion cavities where the interior elements, moisture, liquid, um, and cell structure too, is actually ejected from the plants at the nodal points, just here. Suggested by Dr. Levengood and others, John Burks and so on, and indeed Dr. Um, I think Woodski in Japan and Meaden also in England, that there is an increase in internal temperature. There is a process in the early phase of that 15 seconds where the plants are made supple, they are bent, the artistry is completed, and then hardened. So that when those plants that are now bent without breaking or knuckling, we attempt to lift up, they do break, break off, like carrots, like celery and they are undamaged. Well, the sizes of the circles, the smallest being, as you've seen, and that's pretty well as small as they come, to the very largest, and that's what you're looking at now, just about to pop up onto the ceiling. This guy appeared on one of the shortest nights of uh, two summers ago at a place called Lambourne, and it was half a mile across. Appeared overnight, and there was uh, just five hours of darkness Alongside this road here, the farmer that owned it saw, as he always does, as he, his farm houses over here, just up off the picture. He's convinced nothing in there at 10.30 as the sun dropped down. Five o'clock in the morning when they're out inspecting their crops and checking for when they're going to harvest, as they do. They take the humidity and all the rest of it. They know what's in their fields. Bang. It's there. Now, my experience with the British Army when we were experimenting with the Gazelle helicopters and, and personnel in attempting to construct these things with the help of the British Army, two men would take approximately one and a half hours to construct a 70-foot circle. 
Can you imagine the arming of people and well organized with all the necessary layout equipment and in five hours only and without causing damage or changes at the molecular structure of the plants, put a circle, a pattern half a mile across in a field? I doubt it. Well, the history, 1678. The writing that goes with this, this is a wood carving, a wood cutting, says that the farmer uh, and people in this little hamlet witnessed the devil appearing in a chariot of fire, in a ball of light, remember that, appearing from the sky and cutting his oats into a crop circle. Well, circumstantial, but it's there. We have two other references in the late 1600s that are extremely similar. 1923, 24, and 25, a farmer farming Cheesefoot Head in southern England, the very same field as I saw a cross formed by five circles in 1983, the same field after watching a television program I did in England, I think for BBC television at the time, he wrote a letter, and it reached us through the BBC, saying, I had those circles in my field in 1923, four and five. He wasn't the first to step forward. We had many farmers saying, this goes back many years. We had them in the same fields, and here you've got now one of the correlations in the data. This is not random. We have not put our fingers on the total formula here, of course, at this point. But there's something important about the locations. This isn't your ET or flying saucer hitting a fill, an animal mutilation, and on. It's something different. Because the same fields are re revisited time and time and time again. Only in three cases that I can tell you of are they on the same identical spot. If it always occurred, we'd have been digging years ago. Not so. Large one over here this year, small one over there next. Queen Cupid here, and so on, so on, so on. But the location clearly is important, and we haven't discovered why. Although they're frequently very close to water, extremely frequently, we're looking at about a 90% correlation, and the vast majority of patterns appearing worldwide are within 40 miles of Stonehenge. They are conglomerating, they are conglomerated as it were, focused upon that same area uh, as we have the highest level of circular archaeological sites in the same location. And within a few centimeters to the same dimensions. So 1946, uh, near Salisbury, southern England, there were more reports of the phenomena. 1966 at Tully, Queensland, Australia. And 1976, big time, it hit southern England and has continued without stop since that time. They're appearing in sand in Australia. One case, I believe Oregon, uh, last year, which we're still gathering data on, it's an impressive array of concentric rings in this country in sand, and indeed in snow in Afghanistan, Turkey. And if this is the same phenomena, and we will talk about this, uh, here on the Charles River uh, in Boston, appeared last winter in January, a photograph taken uh, by Donna Colony from MIT and supplied to us through Doug Rogers of CCCS, a photograph taken from the university uh, a series, tens of concentric rings connected by pathways, boxways, on ice which was so thin that it simply would not support the weight of even a, the smallest child. It isn't somebody running about here that has caused this. Appearing in two forms of vegetation, green wheat and yellow, beautiful yellow flowers and brittle plants, oil seed rape. They're appearing in trees. We've had them in uh, two cases only. Remember, we're looking at a, a database of about 4,500 reports, 2,500 that I've personally visited and personally investigated. But we have had two reports, and it's worth putting them to you, in mature 
uh, conifer trees, uh, one being in Wisconsin, uh, and the second in the same year of 1981, at a place where circles have been appearing for many years, same slot, bang dead center in a band of trees running along an old Roman road. They appear on the next photograph in the rice paddy fields as this phenomenon grabbed, grabbed a hold of Japan back about six years ago. The farmers and the people discovering them were saying, as everybody else has been saying, there were no tracks in or out. Here's some big news. Not seen publicly before, this is the first time publicly we can tell you from a, an eminent scientist in Czechoslovakia that the phenomena, as you can see the distribution, has covered the whole of their country. The next photograph will show you of what has been, has come as a tremendous surprise to us, that it's already evolved over the last few years. This is the country now just put back into the corner. These are the patterns that appeared, some of them, in 1994. Running, having run through the same phase, the circles, the single rings, those with tails, dumbbells. This is the guy that I saw in 1983 in southern England. The Celtic crosses, the arrows, the Mars, the male symbol, and so on, into your more complex pictogram. This pattern here may, might be extremely significant. I'm sure they, of course, all are in their own way. But I can tell you that in 1993, a team of researchers, some of them directly working with myself and working with people uh, who provide us mathematics from uh, Dick Hoagland's Mars Project, uh, Carlotto and Professor Hawkins down in Washington, looking at some of the geometries of patterns, they uh, devised a formula and a working model that if this phenomena was attempting to communicate to us alphanumeric form through patterns that we could insert into the fields a pattern devised mathematically, they would respond to a pattern built, constructed to this formula. If we missed one component part of it, perhaps they would infill it for us, they, the circle makers. Well, the pattern which was placed into the field, and which we had no response from, in southern England in 1993, turned up here in Czechoslovakia in 1994. Now that obviously requires, we need to know exactly where the, the alignments and all the rest of the, the grids, we, there's a lot of work to be done. This arrived only four days ago, and you have it uh, to, to consider. So you've had a spread, and that's a small spread, of where these things are actually appearing. It is a global phenomenon. This is not at all peculiar to southern England. This, believe it or not, it demonstrates 96% of the global total of reports investigated. The patterns are referencing to ground features in such a manner the source knows what's on the ground. It has optical appreciation because it's referencing to either color to the boundary of the field, to a tractor tire mark, to vegetation colors uh, changes themselves. This is just an example of where the farmer has applied a higher level of nitrogen, chemical nitrogen, the process is fully understood, to the boundary of the field, caused the plants to be nutritionally different to the remainder of the field, and has caused a, a, a boundary change that can be seen in the color of the plants from the air. From the ground, it's very difficult to see these subtle changes. The aerial photograph is very clearly evident that the, the boundary is there. Well, the phenomenon occurs, a type 2 pattern, which has arrived many, many times, has dead centered, plant perfect, 3 millimeters, perfect, centered upon the boundary change, and its neighbor nearby, as its circumference is butted up precisely to the color change. Freddie's, uh, Infrared photograph, which is what we're looking at here, shows also this, what we are at this point assuming to be an underground archaeological contour site, <coughs> centers exactly to this pattern. This is not evident either 
from the ground level. This is an infrared photograph showing that this complex pattern has not just randomly located itself, it's referenced to a feature precisely. Once again, this uh, beautiful but hot air balloon it reminds me of, but this sort of pattern in infrared again with Freddie's photograph, <coughs> you might think, well, <coughs> excuse me, it really isn't referencing to these tractor tire marks. No, it isn't. Here we have watershed, a watershed contour, which is running through here, and something else we can't explain at the moment. We now have the photograph, the result. This can be checked out next year. This line running down here, and where these two contours meet or collide, or whatever, the pattern itself appears to have grown. Referencing, referencing, referencing. I'm seeing it in virtually everything I look at. Here, this one might not be totally obvious immediately, but once again, the military, the British Army, did some work on this before the cooperation and uh, links, uh, communication channels, appeared to be severed. But prior to that time, they confirmed to me that my aerial shot here indeed was um, proved by their own mathematics, by their own aerial surveillance, that this major axis running through this beautiful pattern was precisely parallel to the color change here, the boundary of the field between the light gray and the brown. And indeed, these fours, these fingers that form part of the pattern were exactly at right angles to one another. And the more simple way, of course, is that they simply will reference to the tractor tire marks themselves. That's very simple, and it literally shares the same axis, the pattern, and the man-made feature of the tractor tire mark. And if I can throw in without appearing to try and steer you, and please, it is, I'd go away unhappy if I thought I'd actually steered you. I simply want to communicate to you information. But I want to say that why not, if one is looking at a subtle, a shifting of consciousness, a shifting of our thinking, a broadening of our thinking, why not simply, first of all, focus our attention upon our environment, the location in which the patterns appear? It will question us, of course, as to the energies deployed and the reason for them appearing. <coughs> and what better medium to use than something that we put there and we can see, which are the tractor tire marks, and the handshake surely would be, if we can prove these patterns hold features that cannot be constructed by human beings, and they are certainly something else, and that something else is using the man-made tire marks, isn't that shaking your hand? Isn't that you did this and you know you did it, and something else did this? Isn't that shaking your hand? Theories. They are primarily those that you're seeing here. The whirlwinds, plasma vortex, underground archaeological sites, they're caused by chemical application, earth energies, hoaxes, for sure. Extraterrestrial, spiritual, the god force, military, space experimentation. That's a whirlwind, and it is causing considerable damage as it moves laterally. That's caused by, for two, the mechanics involved required for the construction and the support of a meteorological phenomenon of this kind are totally understood in the lee of the hill and the thermal effect during the daylight hours. Well, maybe the British government didn't quite think this through because they appear in the uh, lee and the low pressure side of a hill. Many of these things in Australia, in your country, and indeed in mine, are appearing where there are no hills. The other kind of whirlwind is formed a thermal effect between daytime temperatures and during daylight hours, the thermal whirlwind. These things, 90%, are appearing at least 90% at night. That doesn't sound too good for the whirlwind theory. The question has been raised, is there a process involving collective mind processes that could in some way be instrumental that isn't an easy one to answer. But it's certainly, I think, these things are not being formed by a collective ceremony of this kind being executed, if you will, uh, by the Druids near Stonehenge. Well, 
I am not to say too much more. These are the two guys, Doug and Dave. They are the men that certainly put the research back 10 years without any day. On that Monday morning in August, uh, was it 91? I ought to remember it to the day, to the hour. Uh, but these two guys certainly put the research back very, very significantly. But we have learned by this, I hope. And that's for you to view and to contemplate is indeed a circle that Pat Delgado and myself challenged Doug and Dave to make in front of national television, and you didn't see that either. You saw, and I saw it again on sightings, I believe, that last week, the program we did for them had just gone out. They did a clip of showing Doug and Dave pushing these plants down. It would have been great if had they shown the final result. These things have no spiral symmetry, they are badly damaged, they have no well-defined cut-off edges. This is a hoax. Ministry of Defence in Great Britain are monitoring, of course, the crop circle phenomena. This is a photograph that I took, just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And something which is really quite significant too, is that whilst proving, of course, on film that these guys are photographing this, there was cooperation at that time. The pilot was traced, I got into a system where I was able to trace him. His photographs were provided, which we have in our database. And what it shows, think about this. This circle here, when this guy is heading out onto a NATO exercise, he wasn't told to go here, at least that's the story. He went out onto a NATO exercise and on his way by, he saw these circles. He took the photographs, which we were pleased about, and if he had not done, I was about to, as you can see. but. He took a photograph, and this photograph, showing the spiral to be anti-clockwise. Seven hours later, returning from the same military NATO exercise, and taking another set of photographs, the circle had reversed its flow. This is bizarre. This phenomena, whatever it is, revisited, reversed, and the military have the evidence. And so do I. The evolution. How has this thing evolved over, over time? Well, the sizes have increased dramatically, up as you have seen, from half a meter to half a mile. The nearest we have been able to get in England to the Nazca Plain in Peru. I mean, the, this thing is vast, half a mile across. The densities have increased, the complexity has increased. This is the pattern that I saw in 1983, the very conventional, traditional Celtic cross. Spiritual symbol, but let's just hold it there. That's a fact. This is where the, the snowflake froze, if you like, on that May Day 1990, when suddenly two circles were connected by a shouldered pathway. That was the beginning. This very pattern was the beginning worldwide of the patterns becoming much more complex. From May 1990, something happened. This within just a few days, and it's one that I know you have seen even if you've forgotten, hit your, didn't hit your national television, and we did much of it from England at the time, when a German TV crew found this during the early hours. This is a major pattern, hundreds of feet long, appearing once again during a short night, not just one, but another two, almost identical. This symbol meant a lot to the indigenous people. It was sent and given to Thomas Benyaka, the Hopi uh, elder in this country, and uh, his, what well, his thinking, his words, and those indeed from people that uh, were shown shortly after, the Aborigine people and other Native Americans as well. And the term mother is crying came out of this particular pattern. It's an Iraqi symbol, coincidence or not, it appeared the very day that Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and set light to what I would call the mother's blood. The reference zone that we've been talking about. Any there? Well, unless you perhaps are aware of a little bit more than I can show you on the photograph, but enough to, I think, to make my point, absolutely. This shape, the Pentagon, is referenced to about the only Pentagon-shaped field cluster I could certainly steer you to in the whole of my country, on, in the only field available to the phenomenon at the end of the, the growing season three years ago, this mandala appeared in the field referenced 
to indeed a pentagon shaped filled boundary. This one to this, this to this, that to that. And what you can't see outside of the aircraft shop, this particular shop, which of course we have, are the other two boundaries. And that field comes down like that. Bang, bang, bang. Post, I doubt it. This is the photograph that NASA are now using for these uh, promoting of funds for the space program, the future US space, pro space program. And isn't it a beautiful pattern if whatever else I've got wrong? It's a beautiful pattern, that's for sure. It appeared, uh, this is the one that appeared close to Avebury uh, last, last year. The internal elements here, it must be, if, if we're looking at the transfer of information, even if it's people making patterns, it's information. And the information, these standing uh, circles and uh, crescent and rings is part of the phenomenon. It is not involved, they've not been collapsed, so it's information. We now know that the farmer who owns this field was approached by a person offered a large sum of money to remove the contents, not the pattern, to remove the contents have a look at the next photograph which was taken from our aircraft one day later. Bizarre! The farmer paid money to go into this field and shed the contents. The board, the information board, was wiped out. But, surprise, surprise, because the circle makers provided us with another one eight miles down the road and this one they didn't get to before we had secured the information this is a transcendental logarithmic curve and for the architects uh, amongst us you will know this is not easy the only way you can approximate these curves in a field anywhere else without sitting in front of a drawing board would be to approximate many, many circumferences by many, many centers. It's a milling, milling machine effect. It's, the, it, it's a process of, of obtaining this shape. But this is an accurate logarithmic curve, which would be extremely difficult to execute. I took hours to draw this thing on the computer. This appeared nearly 200 feet across in the fields of southern England, not once, but twice. And then we entered that phase where these were highly suggestive of insects. Beetles, bees, fishes, dolphins, spiders. We've had them all. Isn't that gorgeous? Nestled crescents. Now the engineers amongst us might, as Professor Hawkins in Washington has been wondering too, is this more than communication in language? Is this the conveyance of technical information? Well, this is a, rot a symmetrically rotational pattern. In other words, when you're rotating, there are a number of positions where it's repeated. It's the same pattern whether it's rotated, uh, when it's rotated, I beg your pardon. If you select a position on the edge of that crescent, imagine this is a piece of paper and you've drawn it out. Push your pencil lead through and set one spot. Rotate that crescent inside the ring as if it had teeth, gearing, gear teeth around it, so that it rotates within the ring. And the shape which your pencil will scribe out, this way on this crescent, that way on that crescent, this way on that crescent, is a complex asteroid. That's technical information. You get some idea of scale here. This is actually a fairly small pattern. It repeats several times. A disc with two rings uh, <coughs> marked around its edges. That was unique, totally unique. We've only had one of them. It gets lots of eyes when we show this in, uh, in the Asian countries too. Uh, I was with uh, Cynthia down in uh, Republic of China, I think nearly, I guess nearly two years ago now, in Taiwan. And there were actually like ahs to the roof when this came out because every pattern means something different to the individual. You know, one person will see a pattern meaning something that 
is not what the next person sees it to mean. And of course, this is the dragon. As far as Asia is concerned, this is the dragon. We had no idea about this at all. Flying the aircraft over, and we could see that we were about never to know about it. As we saw the snail-like uh, pattern crawling up the fill, as it were, that's the impression that it gives you, towards a fleet of farmers coming in the opposite direction, prepared, and these are harvesters. These guys were about to remove forever this pattern. The farmers in southern England are up to here with this phenomenon. <laughs> and now you can see the lengths that they will go to. This, this is before the field is ready for harvesting, prepared to take their harvest through the center of the field to remove the evidence, not so much the evidence, they want to remove the reason why people are invading southern England to see these patterns. And some farmers, of course, at the other end of the spectrum, continuing to be, thank goodness, extremely cooperative. This guy, Mr. Pitts, near Marlborough, came across this pattern, and because he had only hours before rain to harvest, he finished his harvest and left the pattern for research whilst he burned off the field next door. I think experiences which supported the fact that there was an electromagnetic anomaly here was when BBC television interviewing myself and Pat Delgado in a very large crop circle back about four years ago, suddenly the television camera like Chuck's has there a computer controlled TV camera. Suddenly the red lights were coming on. Just about every circuit, red lights were coming on. The guy had just moved his camera into and onto the very edge of the crop circle. That point, which clearly is the boundary between 100% involved and that which doesn't exist as far as the phenomenon is concerned, the standing plants. On come the fault lights and Pat Delgado, my colleague, who's wearing a microphone almost identical to the one that I've got on here, with the small aerials, a piece of wire out the back, is picking up and I am hearing in the sound engineer headset that stood right next to me. I finished my interview, Pat's in the center of the vortex, and suddenly Pat's saying, my God, it's all around me. His hairs are up on his arms, his hairs are up on his head, and at the same time, this 5.2 kilohertz sound, which we've heard and have recorded now several times, is on the headset of the television camera. The TV camera was totally destroyed, 60,000 pounds worth, totally destroyed. Now, the German research uh, projects two years ago started looking at, with flux state magnetometers, the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic distribution in the fields of the crop circles, and discovered that this is the cir a circle with a nearby neighbor, <coughs> like one you saw earlier, but this time connected by an arcing pathway, that the electromagnetic field had risen above the north, that being five nan nanotesla, five gauze, up to 40 to 50 nanotesla inside the crop circles, up to 300% above the normal Earth's electromagnetic field in that part of the northern hemisphere. Now, converting that information into the next slide, which is a 3D elevation plot, you have the information and you have the pattern of the crop circle. What a result. And that is just one pattern of which a number have now been completed. <laughs> Professor uh, Hawkins down in Washington uh, discovered when he was reading Circular Evidence, which was Pat Delgado, my own first book, and it was the only book at that point, the first book that had been written on the subject. Uh, somebody in England sent Professor Hawkins, who decoded Stonehenge, you might remember, eminent uh, astronomer, a copy of the book. He was running through the dimensions we had placed in the book, suddenly realized that in converting those dimensions to musical tones, to frequency, audible frequency, he could see himself playing the harp, which he plays well. Some of you will have seen that this discovery on sightings a couple of times now. Gerald Hawkins realized that the component parts of the crop circles had a direct relationship, that is, uh, with the diatonic notes on the, in the Western musical scale. He then went on to notice, note that Euclidean theorems were being applied in the crop circles uh, worldwide. 
from the book itself, and that has continued uh, with new information continuing to be supplied to him. Now, when we're talking about theorems, whoever's theorems there are, whether you're into Euclid or not, don't worry about it. I mean, simply just think about this. That unless the ratio of this circle and this ring around it is precise to what is theorem 2, Euclid theorem 2, unless that is precise, and remember, Doug and David have got to know all this, unless that is precise, when you scribe a tangent from there to there, if it is perfectly correct, that ratio, you will expect to finish up back at your starting point. If it is even the thickness of the lead on your pencil, unless it's sharp when you do this at home tonight, you will find it is impossible. It is extremely, that's not correct, it is extremely hard. It is not easy to accurately scribe these lines, finishing up back where you began. That's with the ratios correct. And of course, they only have to be small, a small degree, parts of a millimeter, out in radius here or, or here, uh, to be, of course, impossible. But the crop circle phenomena is complying with a consistent mathematical law. That's even more difficult when you have all of these to complete and still complete it accurately. But these are the ratios we're looking at, and this being theorem four. That's a piano keyboard, the diatonic Western diatonic scale. The ratios I've been talking about, if you were to square the area of a circle, like the circle you saw with a single concentric ring, and compare it with the area of the ring around it, the ratio which exists between the inside and the outside, the circle and the ring, is exactly the same mathematical ratio relationship that exists between an audible frequency when you press C on the Western musical scale, 264 hertz, and the adjacent note of 297 hertz. The same ratio exists. If that is true worldwide, then we have before us a code capable of decoding, because an alphanumeric value can be placed to the four octaves on a keyboard. SETI, with your money, have been looking for a single radio frequency for 10 or more years. As they were looking up into the sky for single frequencies, on the ground appeared a single ratio. It was always considered by the scientists at SETI, and we have direct lines in of it for information on this, that if and when, I think when is much more accurately the, ter the term, a frequency, the frequency they've been looking for, arrived and was interacted with, then a whole array of frequencies would arrive within which was the capability of decoding and therefore one-to-one -one communication. When we started to interfere, if you will, by placing formulas in the fields of South England, a whole series of ratios arrived. Analogy, whilst SETI were looking up into the sky for sound frequency, on the ground appeared precisely what they were looking for in patterns. That's an analogy. Well, we've been looking at measuring the brain waves of people inside the crop circles because dowsers claimed they, with their dowsing rod, were able to detect, um, well, had responses for their rods, which, when um, other dowsers were brought into the process, confirmed indeed that they were detecting something. Didn't know what it was, but the rods would move when they walked over the circumference of the circle. It would twing one way or the other seven times into the center of the circle consistently. So there was a fixed pattern, a dowsable pattern. What was it they were detecting? People were becoming either elated in crop circles or were feeling ill. I've been in two and a half thousand myself, and rarely indeed do I feel sick. It has been so, where I have left one or two early because of the nausea, but I usually feel perfectly the opposite. We have people from different schools, as it were. We went for uh, a field that we might call those that believed and those that didn't believe, didn't believe in basically anything. Okay, so we measured their brain with activity and we looked very closely at the dowsing response. 
It was at this point the fun began. In entering, and this has been going on for some years, this will not be new to some of you. At this point, uh, measure, not only is the, are the rods moving in the direction of the swirl, there is actually a recordable uh, measurement on the equipment itself. On the right hemisphere of the brain, activation, or at least measurable activity, across uh, alpha, beta, theta, and delta, at this precise moment, the rods were moving. First time, we think, still to be developed, that science can support the fact there is indeed a physiological effect, a real physical effect, when those rods move in the brain of the human being concerned. Dowsing is a tool that's been used for many years. It's a valuable tool, and when perhaps we start to have more confidence in ourselves, know who we are, we will have more answers. When it came to meditating, now, here, of course, is a magical state where most of the major inventors of our age dreamt, in many cases, the invention which allowed us to be sat here today in many cases, electricity and so on. This has come frequently from the alpha state, that magical state of meditation, that black screen, that zero feeling. It's hard to achieve these days, let alone, of course, in a busy city, but if you can obtain that state, <coughs> you transmit alpha waves. This is the result, it's actually simply as brain being measured here, we can measure others. At the center of this particular circle, the most effective maintaining of the alpha state, and indeed, uh, the inventor, I'm not sure whether Masahiro is here, but we were hoping perhaps, certainly that he might be, um, the Alpha state maintained in a way that he has rarely seen since he developed his machine right here. And so therefore, my point in showing this is that when people say that they feel elated, very relaxed, something very beautiful about these things, not to be laughed at, because the science supports that this is a state of mind which is achievable and maintainable more easily, it would seem, here than outside. So there's something perhaps much more special about the residual effect after the creation of these beautiful patterns than we might be giving justice to the people who make those claims. These are patterns we recognize. This is a Celtic cross. That is, of course, the traditional Celtic cross. The first one appeared in the crop circles. That's a, a religious symbol. This uh, is a very ancient symbol which is found around the basin, the Pacific Basin, thought to come from the old, the mythical um, uh, Mu, the continent of Mu. That is what it is, where it is thought to come from. And I think it is something like 27,000 years old. It is precisely the pattern, this, that you saw in that field surrounded by the pentagon contours of that field. It's the same pattern. This, I think you will recognize, too. It is indeed the international symbol for the disabled. And because the information, I have to say, if there's a trend in the, the meaning of the information being conveyed, I would have to say at this point that we are perhaps uh, having our attention drawn to disabling ourselves through our mode of thinking and through our activities. This appeared in a field at the press conference on Thursday when national television uh, had available to them a film with a little white disc moving in this field, arcing around here, returning to a crop circle as if it were observing perhaps, uh, monitoring perhaps, the circle itself moving away from the camera position up into the sky that was made available to national television Thursday, and of course will not be shown. The year after that, at the point at which this arc was completed by this little object, this appeared. The computer tells us, in looking at 18,000 combinations of known script on our planet, that this is Latin for apono astos. Some of you will be perhaps wondering, whatever does apono astos mean? Well, it's Latin for we oppose cunning and deception. 
extremely timely, as this indeed was the time when the Hopsers were throwing the glass around our diamonds. That's exactly what was happening when this appeared. Well, that is a hoax. Thank God. Worrying, though, isn't it? Because not only is it extremely well executed, it is true that the plants are damaged. They're not changed at the cellular anatomic level. It is true. But it teaches us that as we continue to provide the information, so the hoax in paternity are fine-tuning and improving uh, their, their application. Was that done over one night? Yes, indeed it was. Yeah, it, it was, it was uh, I guess it's funny also. It was put into a field, as you can see, alongside the A272 major highway in southern England, where the Tour de France was to <laughs> cycle past the following day. Since ancient times, we've looked into the night skies and wondered, how far do the stars stretch out into space? And what's beyond them? In modern times, we built giant telescopes that have allowed us to cast our gaze deep into the universe. Astronomers have been able to look back to near the time of its birth. They've reconstructed the course of cosmic history in astonishing detail. From intensive computer modeling and myriad close observations, they've uncovered important clues to its ongoing evolution. Many now conclude that what we can see, the stars and galaxies that stretch out to the limits of our vision, represent only a small fraction of all there is. Does the universe go on forever? Where do we fit within it? And how would the great thinkers have wrapped their brains around the far-out ideas on today's cutting edge? To begin to get a handle on infinity, we are going to need some perspective on the numbers and scales that define our universe. One place to start is a narrow side street in Charles Dickens, London. A curiosity shop, fictional to be sure. Here you can find an unparalleled collection of stuff. Old shrunken heads, manuscripts, newspapers, books and rare examples of impressively large numbers. From Zimbabwe comes a $100 trillion note. In late 2008, with that nation battered by hyperinflation, it was worth about $1.50 US. Go up two orders of magnitude to something decidedly more useful. The fastest supercomputer in history will soon hum along at 20,000 trillion calculations per second, a 20 followed by 15 zeros. You'll have to run it about a day and a half to equal the number of grains of sand on all the world's beaches. That's around a sextillion, a 10 followed by 22 zeros. That's roughly the number of stars in the visible universe. Atoms in the visible universe? That's upwards of 10 to the 78th power, a 10 with 78 zeros. Cubic centimeters? A mere 10 to the 84th, a septuagintillion. To go up from there, we turn to no less a source than the Guinness Book of World Records. The largest named number in regular decimal notation the Buddhist time period, Asamkhaya, is 10 to the 140th years, or 100 quinto quadragentillions. Then there's the largest number ever used. Graham's number is a calculation of angles in a type of hypercube. 
If you divided the visible universe into the smallest units known, called Planck volumes, the total of those units wouldn't get you anywhere close to Graham's number. But it's still nowhere close to the ultimate ceiling. Infinity. For those who find infinity hard to grasp, even troubling, you're not alone. It's a concept that has long tormented even the best minds. Over 2,000 years ago, the Greek mathematician Pythagoras and his followers saw numerical relationships as the key to understanding the world around them. But in their investigation of geometric shapes, they discovered that some important ratios could not be expressed in simple numbers. Take the circumference of a circle to its diameter, called pi. Computer scientists recently calculated pi to five trillion digits, confirming what the Greeks learned. There are no repeating patterns and no ending in sight. The discovery of the so-called irrational numbers like pi was so disturbing, legend has it, that one member of the Pythagorean cult, Hippasus, was drowned at sea for divulging their existence. A century later, the philosopher Zeno brought infinity into the open with a series of paradoxes, situations that are true but strongly counterintuitive. In this modern update of one of Zeno's paradoxes, say you have arrived at an intersection, but you are only allowed to cross the street in increments of half the distance to the other side. So to cross this finite distance, you must take an infinite number of steps. In math today, it's a given that you can subdivide any length an infinite number of times, or find an infinity of points along a line. What made the idea of infinity so troubling to the Greeks is that it clashed with their goal of using numbers to explain the workings of the real world. To the philosopher Aristotle, a century after Zeno, infinity evoked the formless chaos from which the world was thought to have emerged a primordial state with no natural laws or limits, devoid of all form and content. But if the universe is finite, what would happen if a warrior traveled to the edge and tossed a spear? Where would it go? It would not fly off on an infinite journey, Aristotle said. Rather, it would join the motion of the stars in a crystalline sphere that encircled the Earth. To preserve the idea of a limited universe, Aristotle would craft an historic distinction. On the one hand, Aristotle pointed to the irrational numbers such as pi. Each new calculation results in an additional digit, but the final final number in the string can never be specified. So Aristotle called it potentially infinite. Then there's the actually infinite. Like the total number of points or subdivisions along a line. It's literally uncountable. Aristotle reserved the status of actually infinite for the so-called prime mover that created the world and is beyond our capacity to understand. This became the basis for what's called the cosmological, or first cause, argument for the existence of God. Another century later, Archimedes incorporated actual infinity into measurements of curved lines and volumes. His method boils down to a process of summation. Place a triangle inside a circle, turn it into a square, then a pentagon, and so on. As the number of sides increases to infinity, their combined lengths equal the circumference of the circle. By slicing and dicing curves into an infinite number of straight lines, he was able to compare a variety of curves, areas, and volumes. Archimedes anticipated techniques developed 2,000 years later. 
And yet, his ideas on infinity did not carry forward, due to what the author David Foster Wallace described as a mathematical allergy that developed in response to Aristotle's potential infinity. It was Aristotle's ideas that passed into the Christian era, along with his cosmology, with Earth seated firmly at the center. That view was not universal. Islamic, Hindu, and even some Western thinkers posed alternate views that included infinite space. In European circles, the issue of infinity resurfaced during the Renaissance. In 1543, the Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus argued that Earth orbits the Sun, not the other way around. The old Greek spheres began to fall by the wayside when a distant supernova, then a comet, were spotted by the astronomer Tycho Brahe. These objects seemed to behave independently of the other stars. A monk named Giordano Bruno inflamed the issue by traveling Europe at the height of the Inquisition to proclaim an infinite universe. In the year 1600, he was burned at the stake for this and other heresies. Just nine years later, in 1609, Galileo Galilei used the first astronomical telescope to show that the universe is much larger than we thought. In later writings, he even sought to discredit the distinction between potential and actual infinity. Galileo was forced to recant and the old Aristotelian view held sway. Any attempt to assign a value to infinity, in numbers or in nature, was doomed, for that was the unique province of God. Finally, at the end of the 19th century, the mathematician Georg Cantor sought once and for all to divorce metaphysics from the abstract pursuit of math. Infinity, he wrote, had to be studied without arbitrariness and prejudice. He became known for folding finite and infinite numbers into a unified theory of number sets, considered a foundation of modern math. One of his defenders used a paradox to show how infinite sets are subject to concrete comparisons. Say you've come to stay at this grand hotel. You're in luck because here there is an infinite number of rooms. Oddly enough, you learn there are no vacancies. Fortunately, the manager says, I can still check you in. He assigns you to room number one and directs you down the corridor. Wonderful. Enjoy your stay. Thanks. Then he goes to work, shifting the guest in room one to room two room two to three, three to four, and so on. So in this hotel, there's a number set that includes an infinite number of guests and rooms. Then there's that same set plus you, two infinite sets, yet one is a subset of the other. Being able to use infinite sets of different sizes allowed mathematicians to design equations describing continuous motion and change over time. Echoing Aristotle, a critic of the new set theory, suggested that the end of the corridor is still only a potential infinity, with God representing the only actual infinity. For those who pine for humble accommodations, we'll recommend an alternative later on. Even as mathematicians embraced infinity, astronomers in the early 20th century still saw a limited universe, centered on the galaxy, a flat disk of stars. Did the limits of our vision, like the horizon at sea, conceal an infinite universe beyond? Albert Einstein, for one, believed that if that were true, then the night sky would be filled with dense starlight shining from every direction. We'd reel from the effects of infinite gravity. Arguing for a finite universe 
he described a people living on the 2D surface of a sphere. To them, a beam of light moving through space would appear to go straight on an infinite journey. In fact, it follows a path determined by the overall gravity of the universe and curves back around. Like the old Greek spheres, this view of a static and limited universe began to fall by the wayside in the 1920s. Edwin Hubble and Milt Humason used the new 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson in California to look at mysterious fuzzy patches of sky called nebulae. They found that these patches were galaxies like our own and that some were very far away. What's more, they found that most are moving away from us. The farther out they looked, the faster the galaxies are moving. This fact, known as Hubble's Law, led to an inescapable conclusion that the universe is expanding. Furthermore, if you run the clock back on this expansion, it appears that it all began in one singular moment. That moment has traditionally been described as an explosion. A Big Bang How large the universe has gotten since then depends on how long it's been growing and how quickly. Using an array of modern telescopes, astronomers have recently narrowed the beginning to 13.7 billion years ago. Taking into account the expansion of space ever since, the radius of the visible universe, the part we can see, has expanded out to 46 billion light years. These measurements have raised anew the ancient questions. What's beyond our cosmic horizons? Is there an edge? Or does it somehow go on forever? A new set of answers has emerged from a theory designed to address questions that arose from the original model of the Big Bang. For one, how did the universe get so large? The Hubble Deep Field contains images of infant galaxies at less than 10% of the age of the universe, near the edge of our cosmic horizons. By the time one of those galaxies reached maturity, it would have moved far, far beyond our horizon. And what of all the galaxies visible at its horizons? For another, how did the universe get so smooth? In every direction you look, the density of galaxies is the same on large scales. Astronomers believe that whatever process flung the universe outward must have also blended it in its earliest moments. The theory that addresses these questions was based on the discovery that energy is constantly welling up from the vacuum of space in the form of particles of opposite charge, matter and antimatter. The idea is that in primordial times, an energy field embedded in this so-called quantum vacuum suddenly moved into a higher energy state, causing space and time to literally inflate. And our universe to burst forth. If this theory is right, then our universe is incomprehensibly large. Its author, the scientist Alan Guth, wrote that the universe as a whole would have grown to at least 10 billion trillion times the size of our visible patch. That's a 10 followed by 23 zeros. If you think that's big, a variation on the theory describes the origin of our universe as a physical process that exists far beyond it out into the seemingly infinite void that had confounded Aristotle and other Greek thinkers. In that case, our universe would have inflated like a bubble and joined a stream of other bubble universes frothing up and expanding across an endless ocean of time and space. A related idea theorizes a cosmic landscape unfolding in vast fractal patterns. These new, more expansive visions of the cosmos are not without their paradoxes. 
Logically speaking, with infinite stars, infinite planets, infinite universes, you will also have infinite possibilities. The so-called infinite monkey theorem has its roots in Aristotle's attempts to illustrate the perils of thinking about infinity. Ask a monkey to type, or ask an infinite number of monkeys to type, for an infinite amount of time. You're sure to get a lot of random letters. But there is a chance, however small, that somewhere, somehow, you'll get the full text of Shakespeare's Hamlet. It's clearly absurd. Then again, consider the increasingly strange nature of our universe, as suggested by some new observations. This is where we draw your attention from the famous Hotel Infinity to a less well-appointed alternative. You're sure to get a big welcome at the old Hall of Mirrors. This ramshackle place would have thrown even the great thinkers for a loop. It represents a kind of optical illusion that may be present in our view of deep space, according to a new interpretation of data from one of the most important space satellites ever launched. WMAP was sent out to make precision measurements of radiation left over from a period about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. It revealed an intricate pattern of hot and cold spots, now thought to represent the seeds of the galaxy filaments and walls seen on large scales. The pattern was laid down by pressure waves that ricocheted through the expanding gas of the early universe. One group of scientists looking at the sizes of these waves suggested that some are actually mirror images of themselves. From this, they argue that the universe could be much smaller than we think. That's not the only strange new line of evidence. Tracking the movement of distant galaxies, astronomers found huge clusters moving at about 2 million miles per hour in the direction of the constellation Centaurus. With the results published in a top scientific journal, the astronomers describe an immense gravitational presence that may loom beyond our visible horizon, perhaps another universe that inflated near our own. Ideas like these may well have led to imprisonment or death in centuries past. Now they're a part of a field of study that is bursting with data and ideas. Cosmology, the study of the universe as a whole, has long been infused with metaphysics and philosophy. Today, it's steadily merging into the physical sciences. So, is the universe infinite? Scientists will continue to look for evidence of what lies beyond our horizons, and to test theories on the nature of time and space. But like the room at the end of an endless corridor, the final, final answer will always elude us.